Hello, and welcome to the Sustainable Business Covered podcast. ED Senior Reporter Matt Mace here to bring you a host of insightful interviews at our very own Responsible Retail event in London. Now, it's the uh, morning of the event here and delegates are currently enjoying um, some tea and coffee, probably to warm them up on what's been a rather chilly morning. It seems summer's well and truly over in that, that aspect. And for those of you that aren't aware, the Responsible Retail Conference brings together more than 100 UK retailers uh, to provide them with unique opportunities to network and inspire each other towards creating a more environmentally and socially conscious business model. We've got a host of, of, of speakers throughout the day, ranging from some of the incumbents from the likes of IKEA, and, and to perhaps some, some lesser known people like Smurf Dome later on in the event um, who, who are really championing um, plastic packaging, well not championing it, rather finding a solution for it. I've got the agenda in front of me now and it seems like um, this morning we'll be focusing on whether current business models are, are fit for purpose. We'll be hearing from the likes of Debenhams, H&M and Kingfisher who are going to explain how they're driving consumer engagement into new business models and into their sustainability strategies. And then later on in the event, the likes of Pret, John Lewis and Rapp are all discussing the, the balance between reducing waste amongst consumers during a time where consumers are in fact buying more. Um, so it's a real kind of complex sphere, this one in retail, and I'm keen to get some, some speakers uh, to come in and provide some insight for this podcast. And, and that's why I'm here. I've, I've got the podcast machine in hand and I'm going to see if I can provide you with some exclusive insight from the speakers at the event. So let's go see who I can find. So um, we've just had the first session of the day. You can kind of hear the uh, the cups being collected and the murmurs in the background. People are enjoying a well on coffee break. And I've managed to grab my first speaker of the day for this uh, podcast, Alice Ellison, who is the Head of Environment at the British Retail uh, Consortium. Um, Alice, thank you very much for, for agreeing to uh, the time. I realise it's a, quite a short coffee break we've got, so I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. But you were obviously speaking. Um, you kind of opened the event essentially today as, as the first kind of presentation. And... Um, um, you made some really interesting points on new business models in retail, which I'll get to first and foremost. But I suppose just to start with, how, how, have you, how did you find that first morning session? It, it was really interesting and lots of interesting points raised. And I really enjoyed the panel session, actually, having, having four of us up there, um, some really, really good questions. And I think communicating with customers on responsible retail is re- and, and changing behaviour is really, really interesting. And it's something, like, it's a shame we sort of couldn't, have a whole day on it really just exploring how, how you do that it's yeah it's um it's really big one and i think a, a common theme that cropped up was certainly the uh i think the word used was a bombardment of, of certain labels and how that can be a really um really confusing um aspect so so in far I, I know it's only been one session but your your kind of takeaway from that session is there one thing that, that will stick with you and you'll go home and think actually that was that was a really kind of in, insightful aspect or i think one one is is the labeling actually mm. Um, and yeah, well, what do we do about that? Because when I'm shopping, I I do look for labels, but yeah, there, there are there are a lot, and there is a proliferation, yeah. and you know, not everyone, even I, don't understand what some of the labels are or mean. But I will I will still look for them and, and go by them. Um, and I think the other was that you know the, the the agreement that you know there's no silver bullet on on how to, to mm. communicate with customers or, or what to communicate with customers um but also sort of you know every all the, the retailers who spoke have, have been on on a journey over the last sort of you know 10 years and where we are now i think is, is really interesting and then where that takes us for the future and yeah you made you made a really good point about that journey from the retailers and they're essentially ahead of legislation the microbeads aspect i suppose the carrier bag um aspect of it as well. and obviously you were on a panel um with people from kingfisher h&m and, and debenhams who i think from my perspective I, I don't have you know debenhams is not something we've heard too much from um and whereas h&m are kind of real leaders in this aspect so it's good to have a, a real kind of um i suppose a, a proliferation of companies in that sense but obviously brc works with these companies day in day out so what was kind of what was kind of the brc focusing on at the moment is there kind of a real area that that you're keen to champion so what we're focusing on the moment is um, the, the initiative that I referred to in my presentation, um, which is we have a, an initiative called a Better Retaining Climate, which is a set of voluntary targets commitments, primarily at the moment on environmental sustainability. And we are going to, we're working with members to, to relaunch that and refresh it and we'll announce it and have a, an event in early 2018. And we're incorporating United Nations Sustainable Development Goals into that. Um, and we're looking to really increase participation in that amongst our membership. Um, so it's sort of setting targets and commitments 
which which reflect the sustainable some of the key sustainable development goals and then also offering sort of guidance and assistance to members on what the expectations are of them against those goals so that's our main focus and that brings in a number of areas so it's not just my area on the environment it's sustainability responsible sourcing uh, nutrition health and well-being and also um, employment and skills um, aspects as well so it's something we're working on across the brc and that's a real focus for us Brilliant. yeah it sounds really kind of all-encompassing that's much which i suppose is what the sdgs um, are in general and um uh, obviously sdgs have that kind of 2030 2050 kind of uh, incremental timelines and, and interestingly in there we were talking about new business models and, and, and you're of the opinion that certainly for them to become mainstream in, in retail they're, they're still some way off you mentioned you know the circular economy will you know within a decade will still be on that journey in, in, in essence and it, it was a really interesting point that resonated with me because I've always been of the belief that everyone is aware of the circular economy they, they know what it entails but no one really knows quite what they're doing yet with it it's, it's almost like a buzzword they're just waiting for for real leadership on so it'd be interesting to see how you um or how you see these new disruptors or new business models finally becoming that that mainstream de facto model that retailers like the people in there will take up and, and champion yes well i think it's, it's something um that retailers um, and manufacturers can't do alone we do need um i think a framework um and perhaps some regulation from government mm. and one of our points um, that we are lobbying points at the moment is the need to move away from sort of single issues um, particularly around I mean the circular economy isn't just waste and materials it's, it's much broader than that but yeah. single issues like black plastic food waste you know, plastic bottles coffee cups carrier bags and actually look at you know what is it that, that we that the country needs to do um, to move to a sort of truly circular economy within the next 25, 30 years. Um, and we don't, we don't have that, and, and, and we might not have it for, mm. for some time. So that's, that's the framework we're operating in. I think there will be um, disruptors, and you know, mud, you know, the example I gave of mud jeans and their operation you know, is um, a disruptor, but it's, it's, it's still very, you know, it's, it's still an, a niche approach. Right. Um, but interesting, actually, some of the other panels, that it may be different for different sectors. So, you know, um, other panel members were saying, you know, for, for the circular economy for fashion, um, maybe maybe easier and, and quicker to achieve than, than for some other products. So maybe it's something we need to look at, sort of sector by sector within retail and, and manufacture. Definitely agree, and and I suppose there's there's benefits there. We were obviously talking about consumers today, and there was that aspect of do consumers have that real aspect of brand loyalty, or do they do they kind of trail the internet for for price and, and product in, in that sense? But these type of business models would surely help consumer um, retailers build that trust because they're actively engaging with their consumer base or something like H&M mentioned their kind of swapping aspect yeah. that's that's a loyal customer base so that's surely a, a real benefit that businesses should look to exploit I think it is and and, and they are mm. um, but that alone won't necessarily keep keep a customer right. loyal because there, there's so many other mm. factors that they're you know they're, they're thinking about so you know, and there will also be sort of a number of, so if, if you were looking at responsible retail, responsible fashion, you could still choose from, from five or six, even just on, on that element. Mm. But yes, it's, it's definitely something that, that, that would help, I think, in rewarding. Okay, that's, um, thank you very much, Tom. I realise we've not got long left for a coffee break, and um, uh, I, I know I, ne I need one. I'm, I'm sure you'd quite like a, a drink too. So just before I, I let you go, a nice, nice broad question to finish on. Uh, what makes a responsible retailer? That's a, that's, a, that's a really difficult question. Um, well, as you say, it's, it's a very broad question. Mm. Um, because what do we mean by responsible retail? So, mm. so it, um, you know, it can mean you know, corporate social, well, it means corporate social responsibility. But I suppose then looking again back to this, I would say the sustainable development goals are probably would summarise what um, retailers should be looking at and considering to be sort of truly responsible so all the things in there all those 17 goals will have elements that retailers um can and and um should and are looking at okay so yeah i think that's a really insightful answer and, and thank you very much for your time thank you so it is now uh, lunchtime at the responsible retail um event um, we have actually commandeered the the speakers' room where where they kind of give their presentations. It's empty right now because everyone else is enjoying a lunch, which I've been told is reduced meat because you know climate change is is an important thing. And we 
we're trying to practice what we preach in that sense. But um, I have kindly grabbed one of the speakers and, and stopped them from having lunch at the moment. So um, Dorothy Maxwell, um, thank you very much. And for those of you that don't know, um, she is the Director of Sustainability at House of Fraser. Um, in fact, you spoke to um, us recently, about a month or so ago, a real kind of in-depth article exploring House of Fraser's um, sustainability strategy. So thank you for that. And now thank you for appearing on the podcast. You're, you're ticking off both forms of multimedia in that sense. Um, how, how have you found this event so far? Um, well, th you know, the great thing about ED events is they're high quality events. There are a lot of opportunities for sustainability professionals to go to many, many different events, but I always find over the years ED events are very good quality in terms of the content. But the really great thing, and that happened here today, is that uh, in retail all of the peers come together and other sustainability professionals and while we want to you know not lose our competitive advantage we get a great opportunity to share in a public forum what we're doing some of the common challenges and learn from each other and that's really what I experienced this morning which is just terrific and it's I always find it's interesting in events like the sustainability professionals just talking to sustainability professionals can become a bit of an echo chamber is my opinion it's a lot of people perhaps preaching the same stuff but but as you mentioned retail does have that competitive edge so i think people are, are perhaps more willing especially in the questions to to throw a, a, a few more i suppose punches in that sense and then ask more kind of pressing um pressing questions in that sense but um I want to talk to you about House of Fraser because um, your sustainability strategy is, is a relatively new one, um, I suppose, in its infancy when you when you compare to some of your competitors and peers. 16 months, I, I believe. So that's that's an exciting time, isn't it? It's kind of 16 months on. I imagine that's when you start to see the real tangible um, progress, perhaps areas where you're excelling, areas there's not so much. But how, how did that go, that kind of putting that together? Because it's a new strategy, you probably had a lot of other examples, a lot of other companies you could lean on for, for best, best practice examples, or was this a case of this was House of Fraser, you know, charting off into uncharted territories and, and setting its own agenda in that sense? Yes, well, I am 16 months in as uh, mm. the person leading sustainability House of Fraser. And before that, while there were activities happening that you would you know, expect to be happening, basic legal compliance activities, it, it is now a formal program, and we call it Responsible Retailer. Um, the beauty of formally coming late to the party is that there are many other examples out there. So that has enabled House of Fraser to draw from the best where it makes sense and to leapfrog. Um, but... Uh, my own view from, from doing this in other retailers as well is that, first of all, you have to get to know the business, understand where they're at, understand what are their genuine ways that they have environmental and social impacts relevant to their business. And that's different for every business. Mm. So having done that when I arrived and then agreeing a roadmap of next steps and where we wanted to go and priorities and a plan and a program and all those things, that really had to be turnkey to House of Fraser and also how it has been embedded in the business and really championed by the business is very much a feature of House of Fraser's culture. And that's something we couldn't pick off the shelf from how mm -hmm. anybody else does it because it is a very unique heritage brand. And uh, you know, I, I came into the company to drive a sustainability program because that is something that the senior executives decided they wish to have and they were very serious about that. So that has helped us to shape, design this program and also move it quite quickly, which has been good. So that must be one of the real key benefits of, of like you mentioned, arriving late to the party is that senior executive not buying. It was literally a push from them to essentially establish, which I imagine for a lot of our listeners might be quite quite refreshing having that kind of high level commitment. But um, I, I'd be interested to hear here that you know a relatively new strategy has been embedded, and I imagine like a lot of things, there's perhaps a couple of teaming issues or whatnot. So how have you embedded that across the business and made sure that it's not a that sustainability is not, I suppose, a side piece or, or a, like a side attraction, and it is holistic in House of Fraser. Yeah, again, this was a great opportunity of, of starting with a blank sheet of paper and with uh, senior leadership that were really committed um, to having a sustainability program that was completely relevant to the business, but also practical to what the business does. So the way we did it really was, first of all, to understand where the business was and to understand what we needed to do and where we needed to go. Um, and 
House of Razors culture then has a set of values that defines how the business operates, how the employees operate and how their performance is tracked. Um, to, to meet its objectives. And these are House of Fraser's values. So first of all, we embedded into those values um, our sustainability action and value around protecting people and the planet. That's mm -hmm. basically how we encapsulated it. So getting it at that level meant it was inserted into the DNA of the organization. Then we um, agreed a very clear practical policy, clear aim, three action areas and a program below that that would support the, the rollout of that. And also we agreed a set of KPIs that link directly with the House of Fraser business KPIs. So these oh, wow. didn't sit across as sustainability KPIs that mm. were nice to do on one side. They came into the central business metrics of the organization and how we measure performance as an organization. And they relate to different parts of the business. So they might relate to energy use and uh, reducing our contribution to climate change in a store, or they might relate to um, improving the performance of our suppliers in terms of ethical and environmental credentials across the supply chain. So they cover all the touch points of the business to start, but of course we are only at the beginning, we're only about 16 months in, so operationalizing all of that you know, it will be something that will keep us busy way into the future. And of course, the benchmarks are always changing. This is a, a program that's all about continuous improvement. So we will look to get better and stronger, et cetera, as we go forward and keep flexing and adjusting the program with that. But we have the bones in place and the bones are really strong. And the business is committed from the chairman to the COO who mm -hmm. I report into. And that has really, really been um, uh, a key success factor in what we've been able to achieve in these first 16 months. That sounds um, that sounds really impressive in the sense that, like you said, the bones are there, the structure in place, and it's something you build on. But as you mentioned, especially um, in areas of retail, that House of Fraser is probably most well known for areas such as like clothing and whatnot. It's um, sustainability is is ever evolving. It seems every other week a, a different kind of issue will emerge from the supply chain, whether it's factory conditions, human rights, chemical uses is a real is a real big one. So how, how does a company that has a, a relatively new strategy in place then also kind of scan horizons for perhaps emerging, uh, I suppose, concerns rather than as well as opportunities? Well, it's a never ending job and myself and the small team that works with me, you know, we're hooked into various key sources of information where we can keep ourselves up to speed on really good critical data. Your events like ED and other good events are also great ways to keep oneself up to speed. Um, and we're a member of a number of collaborations as well that help us to attend certain working groups on things like environmental protection, chemicals management, responsible sourcing and so forth. And all of that combined together helps to keep us up to speed. Um, but also so one of the key things that we're doing um, is with our suppliers. So we have a responsible sourcing code of conduct and it outlines what we require of our supply base in terms of things like animal welfare, environmental protection, labor practices, health and safety mm. and so forth. And constantly engaging with them, which is a feature now that we've been doing quite a lot of over the last year. So they understand what those expectations are, but also that we grow capacity because as you're highlighting, there is always something new. So how one can really deliver on a lot of these things that will be in our code of practice, that is something that suppliers need to really understand that and what are the latest tools and techniques and so forth. So we've been really trying to be proactive and we'll do more of that to really grow that capability within our supply base. And then they more easily can deliver on the things that we're asking of them. Okay, Dory, but, um, I'm not sure about you, but my stomach is most certainly rumbling, so I won't keep you for uh, for too much longer. So um, a nice kind of broad question, and, and I suppose the sense of this podcast and certainly this event to find out, um, in your opinion, what makes a responsible retailer? Well, for us in House of Fraser, there's three things that make a responsible retailer. It's about managing our environmental footprint, responsibly sourcing our product, and positively engaging with the communities that we work with. That's what defines it for us. Different for everybody, but that's our definition. Of course, brilliant. Um, Dorothy, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Matt. So we are approaching the end of lunch um, at the Responsible Retail Conference. Um, in fact, I think people are just about to start heading in soon. So the, uh, the next conversation I've got will have to be brief, but I'm sure it'll be uh, still very insightful. I managed to grab um, Owen Griffin, the uh, Corporate Responsibility Manager at the uh, John Lewis Partnership. Uh, so thank you very much for um, taking time out from a rather busy networking session by the sounds of it. Um, so you are about to go, go and sit in, um, and I suppose it's on a session that's very similar to 
the morning, but this morning one, it's, it's focusing on that consumer engagement aspect of it. Um, and I, I noticed that um, some of the stuff that you and, and Delix and Rap will be talking about is, is kind of driving, um, you know, driving sustainability during, I suppose, an area of increased consumption, essentially. And I know one of the, uh, one of the particular um, talking points would be choice editing. And it, it's something that I, I think is a, a great idea to change behaviours. But in terms of engaging consumers on a sustainability strategy, I do wonder how engaging it is because it's essentially not really promoting sustainability. It's just removing the other end of the debate. I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think uh, choice setting has, has emerged as definitely as a theme um, of today's conversation so far. And I think... You know, it isn't a natural place to go to for for the, for JLP, for the John Lewis or mm-hmm. Rachel's. We are much more concerned about raising standards across all our products in terms of sustainability and um, sort of human rights, social compliance, and that side. So really, I suppose it's it's just one of a tool you can mm-hmm. use to kind of uh, manage your impacts, um, manage the type of products you're selling to your consumers. It's just something you would use probably in more in very specific um, and very. Uh, sort of the right different situations um, for a retail business. For a company that is focusing on the raising those standards a- across the board, how how does how do you then, I suppose, give that information to consumers in a way that isn't isn't preaching and, and doesn't perhaps overload them with with stuff that they n- not don't care about, but perhaps don't have a full grasp of understanding on. Um, I think, you know, you just have to be very open about the reasons why you, you do certain things in an organisation. You know, we don't, we, we're not able to please all our stakeholders. Um, there are certain NGOs and, th- and things who wouldn't agree with certain things that we're doing or, or some of the products that we, that we sell. So what you do is you try to explain what exactly you're doing to address any concerns about how those products are made or sourced. Um, and I think, again, with, with choice editing, where you do potentially have to remove an option, um, you want to be really clear to the consumer exactly about why you're doing it and what your intentions are and that you have done the sort of the due diligence to, to, um, to back up why you're doing it. Mm. And one of the, uh, the key things I've taken away from this event so far was the, uh, I suppose, the ever, well, the never-ending debate of the use of labels as a, as a kind of eco-platform. And, um, you know, I think it was said there's 140 labels that can essentially be put on a, on a package and it can be a bit bit too overbearing for, for some consumers um, and we're also getting cases of a lot of retailers perhaps dropping these labels to, to promote their own kind of in, um, sourcing aspects so um, how how does how does John Lewis um, view that I mean I know I know you're you're really promoted to kind of ethical standards and, and stuff like that but do you ever see an occasion where perhaps John Lewis partnership will be not dropping these but perhaps um, lessening the reliances with NGOs as you mentioned to champion your own standards yeah, I think there's two, par- two parts that we, you know, as CSR professionals, we're really um, committed to certification in different, in different situations. Mm-hmm. And we have a lot of things, a lot of products that are certified to different standards. We, so across, across both businesses, we use a lot of labels. However, we're also very conscious about how we communicate with our customers. I think is really, um, really obvious when you come into our stores. So there is probably a longer term conversation about exactly what these labels achieve. But certainly for now, we feel they send the right um, messages to consumers where we want to send those messages and I think particularly there's quite a difference between food and between mm. fashion and home retailing so um, in supermarkets people are much more responsive to them than they are in the, in the fashion and home area so uh, certainly in the next couple of years and for the future you will see labels to continue to some degree because I think that, um, on, I- on issue specific cases they, they make it very clear to the consumer what they're getting. Definitely and um, it was also interesting to hear that they're kind of use of IoT and that kind of stuff to perhaps even relay that information as and when consumers want it. So that was another interesting one. But um, the, uh, the event we just sat on, well, the, the panel session, I suppose, um, was, was a real interesting one. I obviously had Primark on and it was a kind of, kind of debate of price over sustainability. bit, bit different for, um, I suppose, the Donut Partnership, which is obviously has more kind of reaching arms into stuff like fashion and stuff but primarily food but um is is that something that you're still experiencing that the price still reigns supreme for consumers how how high up is sustainability on their i suppose wish list for their products so we we're really clear we haven't seen that message come from our consumers mm. um however what we do know is we have uh, probably one of the strongest brands in the british high street Definitely. it's not um 
one of the strongest brands kind of in the UK across across industries. So we have very informed, very engaged customers that hold us to account very severely and very strongly. So for them, it's an expectation, not something that we necessarily need to communicate. However, what that does mean is if as we move into sort of a more advanced, more ambitious phase of mm. our sustainability journey, we're desperate to communicate these messages somehow. So as CSR professionals, we really want to get them out there. So part of the, a lot of the thinking we're doing currently is how we do that in a way that the customer responds to and sort of moving into enabling the customer to make more positive choices, even if that's not what they necessarily mm. set out to do. Um, so it's a really, really interesting time for that conversation in the business. And I imagine as well, um, new business models emerge, um, not so much circular economy, but also stuff like servitization uh, or um, again, food for the food industry, I'm not sure quite how, how, quite how that would work, but um, mm. it's essentially a chance to strengthen that, that relationship between brands and um, and consumer and you mentioned you know yeah. John Lewis is one of the kind of most recognisable, well high, highly established yeah. um, brands out there. So how does how does an exploration of new business models, whether it be civilization, whether it be economy, whether it be essentially placing consumers back at the into the heart of the value chain, yeah. how how is that going to really build trust and, and expectations amongst your consumers? I think yeah, you you must have had an insight into some of our internal <laughs> work conversations. But basically, you've 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 kind of put a nail on the head there. So uh, if you read a lot about what we're talking about as a wider business, currently it's about putting the consumer, the mm. customer, really, really back into the heart of the business. And so the challenge for us in, in sustainability and CSR in, in the business is to take that message on board. And some of the thinking we're doing around now around the circular economy is about how you interact with the products and services, particularly in John Lewis department stores, mm. not, not so much waitress. And if you purchase something, what can we do with your old product? What can we do with those materials? How can we uh, give you a better service um, around that sort of customer journey while ensuring we um, take responsibility for old, for old products and things like that? So it's a really, really interesting time, but we're certainly very aware of the challenge that it, if we do something in sustainability in this kind of next phase that the, cu the customer has to be at the heart of it. And I think actually that's not something that's come out of the conversations so far today. Okay. I think there's not a lot of marketing, not a lot of communication people in the room. And yeah. If you speak to those types of guys, they're really passionate about how we can sort of um, communicate around these new, these new areas in the future. It sounds like a, a really kind of exciting time um, for the John Lewis partnership and um, I'm wearing um, time constraints right now pretty tight. so just before I let you get on and prepare for your uh, panel session um, the, the question I'm asking all our kind of um, guests on the podcast this week is essentially the name of, of the conference you know, in, in your opinion what makes a responsible retailer? Um, I think it's for me it's, uh, it's peace of mind so there's a couple of go-to brands a couple of retailers I know that I like to shop from because I don't have to worry too much about checking where the labels are, checking where the product's made, checking this, checking that. I just know that from all the communications, a really engaging uh, brand journey that I, I feel rest assured that I can purchase sort of ethically from that, so that brand. So for me, a responsible retailer is one that doesn't have to send any complicated messages or hmm. say very much, but you as a customer are kind of, are, are kind of uh, can be rest assured that it's, that's okay. Okay, so they're not they're not trying to sell anything to you because you you know that yeah. it was comfortable almost. Yeah, and you just you, you get you get their story. You understand. You know, Patagonia might be a good example. Mm. You know that even if everything isn't perfect, they're certainly working towards the last. Definitely. Bit. Um, I know a couple of other you know food brands, Divine Chocolate, whoever it is, you mm. know who to buy from because they've really made the sustainability uh, part of their brand experience, and that to me is. Getting, being both responsible and actually just being a good retailer. Okay, yeah, I think that, that balance is definitely important. Yeah. Um, okay, and yeah, uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, it's been a, been a pleasure. We have um, just finished uh, the, the second kind of, I suppose, session of the day. Um, well, the second one I sat in. We're about f uh, three quarters of the way through the event so far, and uh, people just um, stopped off for a well and coffee break. So the session we were just in was all about, I suppose, retailers' responsibility for for consumer consumption it's essentially it's the, the idea that consumers have more disposable income and they are in essence consuming more so how, how do retailers kind of manage their their waste footprints and and who better to talk to about that um than the um, the uh, area manager for sustainable textiles from rap uh, lee uh maple durham so lee um, thank you very much for, for joining in this. Um, I realise as well that um, it, it was quite an interesting panel in the sense that obviously textiles is your expertise. Yes, but, um, that's right. 
a lot of the uh, the focus on that was um, kind of coffee cup. I think Pret was quite um, yes. quite bold in what they were saying, but it was the whole a- aspect. What he ma- the, the point he made was that there needs to be a great consumer involvement, I suppose, in, in the waste aspect of it. Um, and I suppose it's the aspect of, of a linear uh, a linear consumption model. So before we kind of get onto that, I, I'd just like to grab your thoughts on, on what you what you thought of that event. How how insightful did you find it? What were you going to take away from that as a, as a real eye opener for you? Um, well, I think I, I sort of take away that there's you know definitely a shared responsibility between the retailer and, and consumer, uh, but I think there's um, and the consumer has a part to play. That it you know you, the, the uh, retailer can give out information and and ask um, or sort of inform the consumer what they need to do. But how do we? Uh, move the consumer to being a citizen to take, mm. take their responsibility in playing their part so that whether it be coffee cups or clothing can be recycled and reused and kept in use for longer. I think one of the things I took away from that um, was, was when Pret, um, when John from Pret was talking about the idea that coffee cups as, a, as I suppose a target from, from the media and from the government to, to drive waste efficiency that was easy because consumers understand that, they understand the impact that has whereas other stuff and I suppose in the textiles, they may not necessarily understand, you know, the the thought process behind sustainable cotton, how that really impacts a person in that sense. Um, and so as a person with that kind of expertise, how, how do you see the kind of state of sustainability in the kind of textiles industry at the moment? Um, well, I, th- I mean, I think it's very true. I think in, in comparing coffee cups with textiles is that people, people coffee cups are very visual. Mm. They take them away and think, what am I going to do with it? Whereas... Obviously, clothing obviously is a visual thing you buy, but you don't see the processes mm. beyond that. Like you say, the the, um, the 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 fiber production, whether that's cotton or polyester, the impacts of that, the um, weaving that into fabric and then dyeing that fabric and then cutting and making it, because a lot of that obviously is outside the UK. Mm. So the impacts aren't as uh, local. Um, I mean, we see under Sustainable Clothing Action Plan quite a bit of uh, progress in terms of reducing the carbon, water and waste footprint. Uh, we, recent, we recently published value in our clothes which showed progress of quite a big reduction in terms of the carbon footprint per tonne of clothing and that SCAP signatories that outperformed the rest of industry. So really focusing on what they can do within their supply chain, which is, which is great to see. It's good to see performance on carbon and, and as by association, I suppose, water in that kind of area. And I suppose that from a retailer is operational in that sense, but the waste target for them does involve that consumer engagement um, yes. piece, piece again. So um, there's, there's a few examples of, so we had heard from H&M earlier today about their kind of swapping scheme and, and take back schemes and take back and remanufacturing is prominent in areas like electronic um, electronic components. Yep. I think people, consumers, are perhaps a bit more possessive of, of the clothing they buy, even though a lot of it just gets put in a wardrobe, doesn't yes. necessarily get worn. They, it's something they interact with, something they wear. It's something they're less willing to share or rent or, or send back in that scheme. So how can, um, how can retailers in the kind of tech in, industry really... Um, engage with consumers to, to reduce waste at the end of the life cycle of that product? Well, I think you mentioned some good examples. So there's the M&S uh, shopping scheme mm. and they link up with Oxfam. Mm. H&M obviously have an uh, uh, incentivised return scheme that they've launched. Um, and I think we've seen some work, we've done some work this year with Tesco and uh, Cancer Research UK in terms of uh, asking people to donate their unwanted clothing to uh, cancer research that generates uh, value for the for the charity mm. um, and also is a, a bit of good uh, public relations for Tesco as well um, but you're right I mean there's a huge amount of clothing that people don't use uh, you know hasn't been used and they've just been sitting in their wardrobe and we sort of encourage people to to look at that and get best value out of that whether that's they can resell that um, or they can donate it to charity, or they can share it with friends, for example. Mm. That's ways of keeping clothes in use for longer and getting the best value out of the resources. It's not the same, also, but there's there's similarities to it. To I suppose the kind of the uh, the car market in the sense that car markets are going through that sharing economy aspect right now, where they're doing ride sharing stuff, and it's changing the business model to to essentially produce more, which I think some retailers are, are, will need to get to at some point as demand falls. So how can businesses 
um, I suppose, collaborate, especially in such a, a competitive sphere as retail, on, on new solutions that lead to more kind of reuse of old products and less production of new products while still capturing those economic markets in that sense? Uh, I think well, it's a, it's a, that's a difficult question. I think we, you know, at RAP we do do a, a bit of work on uh, resource efficient business models, and there was a, a slide in the earlier session where we looked at uh, hire and leasing was um, was mentioned, incentivised return, service systems, um, but there is competitive um, pressures between retailers. I'm not sure they'll necessarily collaborate in that mm. s- space. I think what we might see are disruptors in this area and that might um, move some uh, retailers along that route, but I'm not sure it's going to change the whole sort of business model overnight. Mm. I think uh, Alison mentioned that earlier in her presentation about this may take some time to come through, but it's an area that does have great environmental benefits and can really drive value for, for retailers and brands if they get on board. And, and, and I think just to just say, I think very much more of interest to the younger generation. Definitely, perhaps. yeah. And um, you, you mentioned something that's great to get on board with. Um, just to finally touch back on, on SCAP, you mentioned you, you had your kind of up, updated progress yeah. report, yeah. Um, and I think we covered that on our site actually, highlighting the kind of carbon yeah. water reductions. What's the kind of what's the kind of looking ahead the uh, the focus area for rapid in that kind of area? Is it just getting more companies to, to kind of interact with it? How's that going to work out? Um, well, I think some of the key things we, we said in that report were about the uh, the SCAP signatory, especially the retailers and brands, incorporating more sustainable mm. cotton into their into their collections, um, helping consumers reduce their environmental footprint through washing at lower temperatures, and we've seen some progress on that. And for the retailers and brands to really focus on their priority products, mm-hmm. you know, the products they sell in, so looking at hot spots really, what's the high impact, high volume garments that they sell. And I think also through Love Your Clothes, working with consumers or trying to target consumers and try and reduce the amount of clothing uh, that goes into, into landfill because it can be reused or recycled into other uses. So those are the sort of four main focus areas that we're looking to drive for the next three years towards the SCAP 2020 targets. Okay, so it sounds like there's lots of areas that retailers can, can go yeah. down. And um, obviously we've been talking about coffee cups and that's certainly made me thirsty for, for coffee. So I will <laughs> I will kind of let us uh, get on the way. So just before, um, just before I let you go then, I suppose, um, a nice broad question to finish. And, and in your opinion, what, what makes a responsible retailer? Uh, that's a good question. I think for me it's a, a retailer that considers the whole life cycle of its products. So it looks at the supply chain, where the products come from, and there's some presentations this morning about tier one, tier two, uh, going going down the chain, but also then what happens to it at, once it's left the store and what they can do to help the consumers in terms of maximising the value of that product and maybe returning that product, uh, increasing reuse. So looking at the waste hierarchy effectively. Okay, um, that was brilliantly. Thank you very much for your time. So we were just talking to you. All right, thanks, Matt. Okay, so we've just finished the final event at the Responsible Retail uh, Conference. Um, quite fitting that a, I suppose, a powerhouse in this area in the t- in forms of IKEA kind of s- saw us home with their kind of li- live la gomme uh, lifestyle. Um, but I thought just before just before I, I let everyone get on the, the trains to go home, I, I managed to grab um, someone who's been uh, a key part of this this um, event today he, he's chaired throughout the whole day and has has been tasked with perhaps inspiring the audience to deliver a few questions at times when it was a bit of a lull and, and also provide his own insights and that is um dr mark sumner the uh lecturer in sustainability fashion and retail at the university of leeds um mark firstly thank you very much for agreeing to come on this quick podcast and also thank you for uh for chairing um today's event um how, how have you found it I've, I've really enjoyed it. This is the second time I've chaired the event, um, and I, find, I just find it really interesting coming along to these events because there's so many different things going on across the retail landscape. Um, we're, we've been hearing about some new things that we hadn't seen before. We've been having an update on um, some existing um, projects and seeing how they're progressing, and we've also been listening to to some brands and some retailers that haven't really been in this space before and really starting to get an understanding of how they're progressing and and you know what they've been learning from their the start of their journey. So it's been a really interesting um, uh, overview of sort of what's happening in retail at the moment. Yeah, I think we definitely saw that in the last panel, especially when you had IKEA kind of next to Surf Dome. I think everyone those who are is but perhaps not many people know about certain and, and especially what they're up to um, and that was a, a really kind of big area for them on, on that packaging which I think is 
one of the key trends facing retailers at the moment is is not so much their products but how, how their products are interacting with their consumers you know online shopping leads to more kind of packaging as a result but um you're obviously far more um well educated in this than i am so in your opinion what what kind of um what kind of things do retailers in regards to csr and sustainability need to be focused on right now that, that um perhaps it's something you put up today or just something you're acutely aware of that you think this needs to be higher on the agenda i think the the, the packaging um situation you're talking about is quite an interesting example to 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 explore i think that the challenge that retailers have got is that there is a tension between understanding and knowing what the science is telling you so when we when we look at the science when we look at life cycle assessments when we look at the data that is floating around that is telling us actually the biggest impacts whether it's environmental or social the biggest impacts are associated with the product um, after that it's about the product use and also what the consumer does um, at the end of life. And packaging, although is, is very, uh, very visible to the consumer, isn't always the biggest issue that, that we, we need to be looking at. So there is a tension for, for brands and retailers to try and balance up the science that they, they, they know is, is there talking about the, the um, issues that with their products and with their, their operations, balancing that up with um, almost myths and, uh, that, that mm. are floating around within the consumer world. And some of these myths are propagated by media and propagated by, by certain NGOs. Um, and importantly, we can't dismiss those myths because consumers are part of a very important relationship with, with, with the brands. Um, and that's why there's a tension there. I think it's trying to work out how the brands can can work with consumers to address some of those challenges that consumers are bringing to the table, but actually also not take their eye off the ball in terms of there are some really big issues that actually a lot of consumers may not be aware of. Um, and that is not as simple as, as some people have talked about in the past of, of just educating the consumer. Um, we know from the research that we've been doing at the university in Leeds um, that um, consumer engagement can be actually dramatically reduced if you try to educate them and try and overload them with information. So for me, it, it's not a specific, a specific issue or a specific challenge of, you know, is it plastic is it in the ocean, is it social welfare within um, the supply chain? It's actually a more nuanced challenge of trying to balance up that science with um, ensuring that you're, you're taking the consumers with you on this really very complicated journey that we call sustainability. And I think one of the the more challenging things about sustainability is the fact that it doesn't necessarily sit still. I mean, today you've had examples. Um, I think it was Debenhams joined the kind of ethical trade initiative back in 2001 and has slowly built up. We've heard from House of Fraser who launched their first kind of sustainability strategy just 16 months ago. So and it shows the the kind of wave in in what is essentially 16 years how much sustainability has come on. As as a as a lecturer um, in this, you're I suppose you're interacting with ideally the people that are going to be the next kind of generation of, of these retail leaders um, perhaps so is, is there something you've seen that's perhaps de developed over the years that um, professionals in this area now need to develop more so than they have had to in the past yeah I, I think I think one, one of the key challenges is trying to get sustainability embedded truly embedded into the business decision that goes the business decisions that go on at board level and all the way down through to um, uh, middle management and down to you know even those small decisions that are made within buying teams within within a retailer um, and a brand. Um, and, and what what we need to be thinking about there is 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 how we can make sustainability less about it's a special aspect. It's different to all the other business decisions. Mm. If we can bring it in and say it's part of uh, the business decisions you make about logistics, that you make about marketing, about what you make about PR, I think it's got much more opportunity to be embedded. The challenge is how do you do that? How do you actually get it embedded in the business decisions? And I think what, one of the things that we, we need to start thinking about is, is, is for example, um, externalised costs. If we can start to understand what those external costs um, of climate change may be, or the external cost mm. of social injustice may be. If we can start to understand what those internal external costs could look like when we when a brand has to internalise those into their own cost structure, and then what does it mean for their consumers in terms of prices? I think we can then start. We end up start talking a language that the business community is very fluent in: pounds and pence. 
as opposed to trying to balance up you know some very very complex mm. um, issues so I think for, for me it, 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 it's it's a the, the challenge for anyone working in this area and for people who are starting to come through um, um, uh, through through unit and how we create that that um, that call to action I guess to, to, to make that happen I'm worried that uh, I don't want you to miss your train to, to Leeds imagine it's quite a journey back otherwise so um, I'll, I'll keep this final question brief and it's a question I've asked everyone up throughout the day and it's it's broad in that sense so um and it's essentially the name of, of the conference. And in your opinion, what do you think makes a, a responsible retailer? Well, that, well, there's a question to finish off with. Um, I think a responsible retailer is, is one that is actually um, exploring and understanding the impacts of their decisions. Um, I think a responsible retailer is also one that is going to challenge the status quo. Uh, and what I mean by that is, for example, referencing, you know, um, we talked about before science and myth is, is you know being having the ability and having the um, confidence to stand up and say actually I understand where you're coming from but that is not what the science is telling us. I think a responsible retailer is also one that recognises that they can't do it by themselves mm. and they're willing to work in, in collaboration and they and, and and truly contribute to collaboration rather than maybe in some cases sort of almost freeloading um, and not engaging. I think a responsible retailer is also one that is, is saying to their stakeholders, yes, we are responsible for lots of things and we will take on that responsibility, but let's be clear, you as a stakeholder in this um, situation, this scenario, you also have responsibilities. And that's, that's not about saying a retailer is offloading their responsibilities, but sometimes the retailer is just not in the right position to be able to resolve those issues. But identifying a stakeholder that has much better opportunity and much clearer lines of responsibility may be a better, a better way of providing a solution for the long term. So I think about you know some of the, the some of the supply chain issues that we that the industry is facing, and I think about some of the stakeholders in that supply chain who are hiding behind retailers, who are hiding behind other suppliers who are just sitting there going, you know, I, I have a big impact on these things, but I'm not going to get involved in this. I'm going to let someone else deal with my responsibilities. So I think, you know, that there is, um, is a, to be a responsible retailer, there's lots of different things that, that you need to do. And I think, you know, taking the long-term view of this, of sometimes going, I am being responsible by saying, this is not my issue, it's someone else that needs to resolve mm. that issue. I think is a difficult one to do, but may, as I say, in the long term, may, may actually be um, a more, forgive me for saying this, a more sustainable solution <laughs> to the sustainability problems. Um, Mark, what a what a brilliant way to kind of end this podcast. A really kind of in, insightful and an in-depth answer. So, um, thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. As I let Mark go and uh, get his train home, and as I start to think about going home, what's been a, a rather long day, that the, the lights are beginning to turn out and the uh, the clean stuff are all coming in, so I don't want the, the vacuum to to kind of see me out. So I will say that that's that's it. It's been a, it's been a really great day. Um, be sure to check out some of the coverage we put up online as well about it. So before I leave you, again, just another reminder: that this podcast is available on iTunes by searching "Sustainable Business Covered," and can also be accessed via the Easy website. Again, any insight requests or potential people that you feel we should be contacting, please do send us an email to either podcast or newsdesk at fav, F-A-V, hyphen house.com. So this is goodbye from the Responsible Retail Conference. Goodbye. Goodbye.